Uh, Chad Myers, that is motion there. Why is the car driving to the launch pad? Because that hold we were telling you about has been lifted. And now the countdown clock has started again. It's below 44 minutes here. Uh, whatever the vehicle readiness issue seems to have been addressed. Uh, we should note who's driving that pickup truck with the crew inside? Well, it's Jeff Bezos, who owns the company. Uh, we're going now to Kristen Fisher, who's on the ground. Kristen, did you get any more detail about what caused the hold and, and, uh, and what happens next? No word on what caused the hold. The uh, Blue Origin webcast simply said they went through all of their checks. The vehicle was deemed go for launch. So at this point in time, you can see William Shatner in the middle seat, in the back yeah. seat, making his way to the launch pad with Jeff Bezos driving. Uh, quite a moment for the founder of Blue Origin and uh, his childhood hero sitting in the back seat, the actor who, of course, played Captain Kirk uh, in all of those Star Trek franchises and you know there's really something to be said about this is not just a space flight for these four crew members this is also an experience that started on Saturday it's an experience in, in team building in crew building uh, they spent two days in astronaut training here at launch complex one even though this is a totally autonomous spacecraft they don't have to do a whole lot and one of my favorite things that that William Shatner actually said was he actually made a mistake and described it as rehearsing instead of training uh, clearly hard to uh, uh, you know get past some of the language that he's been so used to as an actor for so many years but uh, that line along with the fact that he keeps talking about how terrified he is he says he's scared and you know Erica you and I talked about this I just found it so refreshing to hear somebody actually say hey I'm scared to go to space I'm excited he has full confidence in Blue Origin and the crew that he will be able to get up to space and back down to earth safely but he's also openly admitting that he's afraid and that is you know yeah. historically speaking not the kind of right stuff that you want uh, professional astronauts to say but you know one more thing Jim uh, Blue Origin has just been under tremendous scrutiny uh, yes this is a time of celebration for the company on the verge of their second crewed flight after you know nearly more than 20 years in business um, but this is also a time of intense scrutiny because uh, just two weeks ago you had 21 current and former Blue Origin employees sign on to an essay uh, complaining about what they describe as a toxic workplace environment where uh, professional dissent is actively stifled. They complained about sexual harassment concerns, mm -hmm. but also safety concerns. And these are all concerns that Blue Origin adamantly uh, denies. And so even though the company denies it, they also very clearly have taken great pains throughout their webcast today to stress the emphasis on safety that they are putting on not just this launch but every launch and I should also yeah. note that there have been 17 successful consecutive launches of this new Shepard rocket so they believe in it Jeff Bezos clearly does he flew on it and William Shatner and this crew says they do too and, and Kristen Good. you know it Oh, so I was just going to say, if I could ask Kristen a quick question, too. In terms of Audrey Powers, right, I mean, we asked her about that letter. Did it give her any pause? She said no. But she has not only an incredible career, right, when it comes to her time at NASA. She's, you know, she's also a pilot. She's an attorney. Yeah. But also her specific involvement when it comes to safety for Blue Origin. You know, has there been any talk about if or why that figured into her being on this particular flight, this particular launch? You know, that's a great question, and Blue Origin did not address it, but I mean, it, there was always a very good chance that they were going to put another Blue Origin employee on this second crewed launch. And if it was going to be any employee, Audrey Powers was always going to be at, at the very top of the list. I mean, she has been uh, intimately involved in the new Shepard uh, rocket, its development, its safety everything uh, for eight years now. I mean, very few people know this rocket as well as she does. So uh, it is fitting that she is one of the faces of Blue Origin right now as it deals uh, with a lot of these accusations from inside and outside of the company. Um, but just objectively speaking, she is somebody who has always wanted to go to space, uh, worked at NASA for so many years, uh, and definitely deserves this ride into space.
Kristen Fisher, thanks so much. And we should note, William Shatner is on board. There are three other crew members. We mentioned Audrey Powers. She, she was a flight controller for NASA for 2,000 hours uh, of console time and mission control. Dr. Chris Bosch is in uh, Planet Labs with that company now, but he also was with NASA's Ames Research Center. Mm -hmm. And Glenn DeVries, he runs Metadata Solutions. It's a company that does clinical research. Those are the four being driven now to the launch site by Jeff Bezos. Now, we should note that Blue Origin, the company, just tweeted, we are a go for number NS18 astronaut load. load. Again, noting that point, there have been, uh, this will be the 18th launch. The crew headed to the launch tower for final prep preparations and also their entry into that capsule. Let's bring back uh, for a moment now Chris Hadfield, former commander of the International Space Station, Miles O'Brien, a CNN aviation and aerospace Analyst. Also joining us, Dr. Bernard Harris, a former NASA astronaut, the first African-American to walk in space. Great to have all three of you here, uh, particularly good to have folks who've been in that position before waiting for launch time. Perhaps I could begin with you, uh, Dr. Harris. Just describe what it feels like to be moments away from launching into space. Uh, in this case, it's three times the speed of sound, more than 2,000 miles an hour. W what do you feel in, in those moments before you go? Well, you know, um, it depends on whether it's your first mission or your second mission. So as I think about what's happening now, uh, I have to reflect back on my first mission. And there is a sense of nervousness. Sometimes I, I will joke and say, you know, I'm an American astronaut. I don't get nervous about anything. But that's not true. Uh, it is not normal to blast off in space, although it's getting pretty, pretty commonplace these days. <laughs> Not, not normal. Uh, it's getting more commonplace, but yes, uh, I think most of us would agree with definitely doesn't feel normal. As we look at this, uh, Commander Hatfield, uh, I was struck by something you said in an interview, I think earlier this week. Um, we were talking about what it must be like in these moments, especially if it is your first flight here. And you said the best antidote for fear is confidence. Um, I know you've been, you know, in touch with William Shatner. Is he feeling confident, you think, this morning? Mm. Yeah, he's a confident guy, and he's had a good look at it. Uh, you know, he, he does his prep, and he's talked to everybody. He's not just going for a lark. I mean, uh, part of the reason that you can feel confident getting on board like Bernard did and I did when we flew was because of the preparation. In this case, he's, he's not flying the ship, but, mm -hmm. but he, he's not randomly there either. And so do your homework, learn your lines, make sure you're <laughs> ready for the moment, and that gives you a great calm and, and, and a confidence that, that you know, you're going to be able to play your part. And, and then at some point, you have to be slightly fatalistic and recognize, you know, in his case, I was born in 31. I was 30 when Al Shepard flew, you know, and mm. now I'm getting a chance. If I die today, hey, you know, I'm 90. I've led a full life. I'm probably not going to die. And this is a great experience and it's worth the risk. You got to get that sort of settled inside yourself so then you can actually live the moment. And, and uh, talking to Bill, I'm pretty sure he's done all those things. Think of that, uh, someone who's lived 90 years, all the technological advances they have witnessed over that time period. Uh, we had Scott Kelly, of course, a very experienced a astronaut on just moments ago. He's had 520 days in space over four flights. Miles and Brian, he described it as punching a hole in the sky, right? Space is hard, even if you've done 17 launches prior on a vehicle like this one. Just describe the technology that goes into this, each launch. Well, we used to say when they're, you know, strapping in the likes of uh, Kelly and Harris into shuttles that, you know, it's a million plus moving parts all from the low bidder. And mm. uh, that and you know, many of them single point failure parts. So it's scary stuff. Uh, this system, we should point out, is a lot safer than the shuttle. Of course, it's not going mm. nearly as far and not nearly as much energy. It takes about 15 times more energy to put a craft into orbit than what we're going to see here today. But crucially, there is a crew escape system here. The capsule separates from the rocket whenever there's trouble, and they come down under a parachute. And the shuttle didn't have that. So, uh, you know, as they're sitting there, uh, yes, there's a lot to be concerned about when you're doing this. And of course, as the astronauts uh, on this panel will tell you, uh, what they would frequently do is recite the astronaut's prayer, which is, dear Lord, Mm. Please don't don't let me be the one to mess this up. I clean that up a little <laughs> bit. But these, since they they don't have any particular uh, tasks, they don't have to worry about that prayer. They're going for the ride. They can enjoy it, and they got yeah. those big beautiful windows, and they know they have, relatively speaking, a safe way to do it.
But by the way, Erica, I'm going to steal that prayer just going forward uh, for, for, all, for all uses, uh, professional <laughs> and otherwise. Fair enough. Um, that, that big, beautiful window, I mean, that's, you know, what we've heard. We know William Shatner's looking forward to looking out of that window. But, you know, Dr. Harris, give us a sense of what was that first moment like for you when you felt weightlessness for the first time, when you were able to look out of that window and see that view of Earth from space? Well, it was it was wonderful. As, as Miles and Chris talked about, the shuttle is a little bit different animal. We go up to 250 nautical miles above, above the Earth, uh, traveling at 17,500 miles an hour, which means we go around the world every 90 minutes, the sunset or sunrise every 45. And I remember our, our uh, launch profile takes about eight and a half minutes or so, uh, pulling about three, three and a half Gs on, on the way up. And you go from, you know, that force on your body to zero gravity in a split second. And I just remember sitting in my seat and noticing my checklist. This is the, the uh, books that we use in order to make sure that we do everything right, that we don't, as, as was mentioned a minute ago, don't mess things up. And so it just began to float up in front of me, and I realized that I was mm. in zero gravity. And so it was a wonderful experience because now you know, I'm, I'm bound in my seat, and what I want to do is I want to get out and, uh, and, and experience microgravity. So I unbuckled my seat and I popped out like a toast out of a toaster and getting the <laughs> feeling of, you know, of your space legs, as it were, mm. uh, was neat. And so I, I floated up to the window and looked out for the very first time and I actually, in our orbit, actually ended up looking up at the Earth instead of mm. down as you would. Only think about so everything is changes of course well dr harris you just made this 12 year old boy very jealous as you as you described that uh, i'm picturing myself with skittles you know kind of popping them into my mouth in weightlessness i just as we watch that live picture Erica, i just learned something i didn't know they got to walk up yeah right i mean you picture all the launches at nasa you know there's that, those famous elevator rides up but they gotta they gotta earn they gotta earn uh, it's a few flights of stairs they gotta earn their ride <laughs> on the spaceship definitely getting their steps in today mm -hmm. um that is for sure going up those up those stairs as they make their way up to the capsule there um i have to say i just love dr harris i loved watching your face as you were recounting and reliving that moment because you could hear it in your in your voice but to really see that you know that smile on your face that joy i mean it really you know i'm right there with you, Jim. It's just an, an incredible thing, yeah. even just to just to hear about. Um, I also want to bring in now Jonathan McDowell. He's an astrophysicist at the Harvard Smithsonian Center. Um, great to have you with us this morning. You know, as we've been talking so much about, especially for astronauts, part of what they would be thinking about in these moments would be not just that journey, but their mission. Um, and we talked about this a little bit earlier, but I know for you, there is a real mission to these launches and to what could come of this. What do you see coming out of a day like today? Well, you know, I think we're really seeing a new phase in the history of space tourism. And, and I think a lot of people have forgotten that space tourism isn't new. It started in uh, 2000 with uh, billionaire mm. Dennis Tito flying to the space station. But what's new now is these suborbital missions are, um, you know, they're, they're a lower price point. There's maybe more people that can afford to, to take them. And we're seeing, we're seeing this flight at the same time as there's a movie crew on board the International Space Station, a Russian movie crew. There's a Japanese billionaire preparing to fly to orbit. And so we're just seeing this rush of this new era of space tourism. No question. We're watching the crew there get ready. Um, it's called a shelter room there. We are just passing 30 minutes to launch time. Uh, all these steps are key. You noted they had to take off those kind of little booties over their shoes. You, you, know, you want to keep, I imagine, the capsule clean from dirt uh, and, and dust. Uh, Commander Hatfield, can you explain to us and to our viewers how important these final little prep steps are because, again, space is hard uh, and uh, you don't want to get anything in the way of a successful launch. 
Well, I think one of the most important steps right now is that Bill Shatner just sat, sat down. I mean, that's a 90-year-old. <laughs> I noticed that, just too. climbed multi-stories. I mean, yeah. I, I really hope that at 90 years old, uh, I'm as physically able as Bill is right now. So I'm glad he, he's taken a moment to catch his breath. But before Bernard and I flew, we go through a quarantine. And part of it is because we don't want to take disease up to a space station or something. But also, uh, it's a time to gather yourself and to get psychologically ready for the risk that you're about to take and the mm. import to you personally of what it's going to mean to separate away. And just before we launched, we got into a little square painted white room like that as well. And it's sort of the last goodbye step to Earth before you climb into the ship and go. So uh, I, I think that's just one more important uh, phase before they're gonna climb in, get on their backs, and and, and boldly go away from the atmosphere and, and uh, out into the blackness of space. It's a good moment. You just heard each one of them ring that bell um, as they went to walk through this tunnel, uh, which says above it as they walked in, light this candle as they make their way uh, out there. A hug there, Audrey Powers. Uh, it is, um, it is quite a moment. I can only imagine what is going through their minds as they take these final steps uh, over there to get to, get to the capsule. Um, Chris Hadfield, when you, when you look at this um, and where this is taking us and, and the variety of the people who are on this flight, um, chosen specifically, what is the importance, would you say, of these different passengers. We have Audrey Powers, who has this extensive history, both you know, at NASA and at Blue Origin. You've got William Shatner, of course. I mean, we know the Star Trek history, um, but that brings a certain mm -hmm. Hollywood element to it. But Chris Bosshausen, Glenn DeVries, um, when you have this varied crew, what does that say about the future of space travel and space exploration? Yeah, I think it's really uh, important to notice that Chris, who's gonna be there sitting beside Bill, uh, Chris was was inspired by the by the fictional role that Bill Shatner portrayed, you know, when Chris was growing up, and then Chris, you know, he he was colorblind, so he didn't have a chance to qualify for the old standards we had to be an astronaut, but he was involved. He got he got into NASA, he worked for NASA, and then he recognized there was tremendous business potential with the drop of cost to access to space, and he helped form the company Planet that has hundreds and hundreds of little cameras that allow us to see and learn about the world every single day mm -hmm. for what the North Koreans are up to and how we're changing the planet itself. You know, he turned that inspiration, and it's so lovely that they're actually beside each other, into a personal aspiration, which then became one of the leading space yeah. companies in the world. And that's that's just one guy's example of the motivation that a, an event like today can bring. And so I, I think the variety of the crew that you see, it's each one of them hopes and dreams and the successes they've had in life all coming together to cross over into this moment to do something that is still one of the rarest of human experiences. Uh, and, and the human stories to me are, are obviously the most interesting and the ones that really matter. And, and I'm really delighted for all four of them. A, a few statistics. They're going to go 62 miles high, just above what's known as the Kármán line to get into space. The, the mission's going to take about 10 minutes with three minutes of weightlessness. Their speed uh, at peak will be three times the speed of sound. That's more than 2,200 miles an hour. That is fast. They're going to feel a lot of Gs uh, in those seats there. As far as a, a ticket cost, uh, we do know that William Shatner, he's, he's comped, as it were. He's writing a, an invitation to the company. Blue Origin's been, been somewhat coy about what its ticket price will be going forward, though they are now opening it up to the public. My, Miles, I do want to ask you a question because there are good aspects to this, and, and I've asked Space Force this directly. Do, are they happy to see private companies operating more in space? And they say they are. It gives them, for instance, more options to, to launch their satellites into space. But there are questions, right, uh, about what the regulations and controls are, how many folks are going up, not just for flights like this, but, but who can launch satellites. I mean, you've got microsatellites now, many of them up there as well. You even have countries such as China and Russia uh, deploying weapons in space. Do we have a good handle? I mean, who's running things in space these days? It's, it's, it's kind of a wild west thing. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, the, I, I'm, what, what mitigates against all this worry is space is a pretty big place. Having said that, 
Routinely, the International Space Station has to nudge itself out of the way of projectiles, which would clonk into it and potentially pierce that thin aluminum skin. So that's an issue that has to be rectified. And and just the, the control and uh, the regulatory environment around these launches, basically, the FAA has taken um, a fairly arm's length approach to this. In other words, if you're the person who's willing to strap themselves into this, sign all the waivers and go for the ride, go for it, they say. What they're worried about more in their regulatory uh, mission is something happening that would uh, land on the ground and hurt innocents. Mm. Now, as time goes on and as more and more people uh, decide to become a part of this, that might change, right? We might have to think about yeah. uh, a safety regimen which protects the passengers at some level. But it's it's a very risky proposition, mm -hmm. space is. And so um, I don't know how that's all going to sort out. I do know this, though, that, you know, it's um, a regular, you know, too many regulations uh, can make it very difficult to explore. There are also questions, too, about uh about the environmental impact, right? And and while there's talk about cleaner fuels, the reality is there's a lot of waste generated. And, and Miles, that's a concern too. Do you think that is getting enough attention? Is it being glossed over? Well, I, you know, I, I am um, a person who worries every day about the climate emergency. Don't, don't get me wrong. But in the grand scheme of the carbon and the uh, fossil fuels and the greenhouse gases we put in the environment, this is... Uh, pretty much a pinprick. Uh, I, you know, listen. There, there's there's a lot of weird optics here, right? Billionaires racing each other for bragging rights to go higher and and mm. farther. Who gets who gets William Shatner on there first? This kind of convergence between Hollywood and reality, between art and life. It, it's kind of it's it's a it's kind of messy right now in a way. Mm. As exciting as it is too, and I think a lot of re regular people are looking at it, scratching their heads, going. What is this all about? I think as it unfolds, it'll become a little more clear to people and it'll become a little more routine. I suppose if we had the media environment we have today in the 1920s when people were getting on Ford trimotors, we might have had similar discussions. Yeah, tw Twitter in the 1920s, that would have been interesting. Uh, but there are, there, there are genuine safety questions. Virgin Galactic, uh, there was an investigation as to whether on their flights they flew outside their assigned safety window, which is assigned uh, in case there is an accident so that you reduce the possibility that some of that debris might impact people on the ground. Th these are real questions that have to be asked and, and addressed. Uh, Dr. Harris, uh, again, we have you with us here, another experienced astronaut. Uh, do, do you believe... Those safety questions for private companies like this have been addressed sufficiently. I think that uh, a, a lot of this has been addressed, and that's because most of the private companies have learned um, lessons from NASA. Uh, some of them have actually uh, gotten uh, technology advice, and as we see today, also um, NASA engineers are part of the uh, commercial efforts in, in a number of these companies. So I think safety is uh, at the top of, top of mind for most of these companies. Mm -hmm. uh, to what Miles said a minute ago, uh, as we have more and more people, and you know, I kind of think of this as, you know, the, as a gradation of, you know, you've got astronauts that go into low Earth orbit, you have the, uh, the, uh, the uh, tour, tourism effort that's happening now, We've got deep space flight. So you're going to have this whole continuum where there is going to be this continuum of human beings at different aspects and different levels of, of space exploration. And so that's going to really require the FAA, uh, perhaps NASA, uh, perhaps even the UN that's involved and in, uh, that has uh, committees that deal with space to develop uh, uh, better regulation around this whole effort because it's not going away. Mm. Um, Think of, you know, I, I tell people all the time, think about this. Our kids that are growing up now will never know a world that, where there will be no one in space. Wow. From now, from this day forward, there will mm. always be humans in space at some level. Mm. Uh, in low Earth orbit, yep. the range on the moon and Mars. And to me, that's very exciting. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, uh, to his children, to his family, uh, then, of course, uh
astronaut uh, Crispy. He goes. He, he also is a DJ on the side, DJ Crispy. And then, of course, uh, our other customer, astronaut DeVries, Len DeVries, in the final. Jonathan, stage. apologies. Uh, we're listening there. Uh, you know, it's, it looks a little bit like a kind of modern day mission control, right? A little smaller than what we imagine from, from the NASA flights. But you, you were making a great point about this crew. Yes, there is William Shatner, but you got three, you know, you, you got some folks here, you know, rock stars in science and space. That, that's right, yeah. I mean, Audrey Paris has been, uh, mm -hmm. not, is not just a Blue Origin employee, she's been a force in the kind of new space community for many years. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, uh, Chris Boshausen, together with uh, uh, Robbie Shingler and, and Will Marshall, founded this amazing company, Planet, which is uh, really, you know, for decades we were talking about how small satellites would revolutionize the space business, but they actually made it happen. And and so so this is not just you know the uh, random people who've had an interest in space. They've really contributed to uh, the the new space era that we have. De Vries, he's the other guy that none of us know, mm -hmm. but uh, mm -hmm. uh, um, so so he's maybe more the typical tourist that we'll see going to space in the longer term. Uh, the person with a lot of money who's just a fan. Yeah, the, the person with a lot of me. I mean, there, there has been such a focus on, on that aspect of it. Um, but I do think it's important to point out, as you were just going through their resumes there, you know, the, the real involvement that both Audrey Powers and Chris Bosshausen, who, as we just learned, his, uh, uh, his handle is apparently Crispy because he also goes by, uh, both goes by Crispy in his musical career. Um, mm -hmm. So as we were just listening in there as they were doing that communications check. So the clock now, uh, T minus 16 minutes. Um, and as... We are told they are just closing the hatch right now. Uh, you can see the picture there uh, up high in the sky after they climbed those stairs. A little dark in that shot, but the hatch being closed. Um, as they as they prepare, uh, you know, Commander Chris Hatfield, as you're um, just just walk us through in these moments, right? Hatch closes. There you are. I mean, you had a, mm -hmm. a little bit more time, obviously, to sit there and wait um, before the launch, but. These, yeah. you know, 15 minutes or so, 16, 15 minutes, I would imagine those are going to feel kind of long. <laughs> yeah, there's two things going on. One is you got stuff to do. And that's, you know, getting all of the things configured right, getting those straps that are going to hold you securely in your seat, getting those done right, getting all your gear in the right place, all the stuff that they, you know, that they rehearsed for, that they trained for. Um, but then suddenly there's nothing to do. And now all you really have to do is think and imagine about what's going to happen and, and listen to your heart actually starting to beat faster and faster. And our flight surgeons, our doctors, used to come on the loops just to sort of chat and talk with us and, you know, because they're monitoring our heart. And when I flew on the Russian rocket on my third space flight, um, they actually asked us, what music would you like us to play? And they tried to find something, you know, that would distract and soothe us. And that was coming through the headset in those 15 minutes before launch, just to get everybody sort of um, centered and calm and ready for the violent events that are just about to happen. By the way, who closed the hatch door? Someone you might recognize, Jeff Bezos, <laughs> owns the company. He was the one with the wrench there, tightening it up. Uh, Dr. Bernard Harris, former NASA astronaut, first African-American to walk in space. We understand coming up is a pressure test. Uh, got a lot of tests leading up to launch, and here we go. We're, oh, wait, I just noticed something there. That H there and the, count, the clock counting up means another wow. hold uh, at 15 minutes. Uh, you'll remember this is our second hold this morning now. Uh, in the last hour, uh, held uh, about a half hour or so, I think, as they uh, dealt with a vehicle readiness issue. We don't know what is causing this hold here. It's a short one so far. But Dr. Harris, as you watch this, uh, any significance to each of these holds? Well, you know, I don't know the profile, launch profile of this vehicle, but uh, in, our, in the shuttle program, which I flew, we had built-in holes along the way. And those mm. holes allowed us to make sure that the systems uh, were uh, correct, that were, they were used for system checks. So this may be the reason why they're having a hold. Don't know. I guess we'll find out in a, in a few minutes. And so all of this, uh, you know, in, in rocketry and, and launches is sort of a normal process where you have these checks and balances along the way uh, because you want to make sure that things go right. Um, you know, in, in our world, when things go wrong, it's mm. we call it a bad day. And yep. you know, a bad day is uh, one that you may or may not walk from. So you want to make sure that you get everything right.
Definitely want to make sure that happens. Uh, Blue Origin just tweeting that final checks are underway. Um, Miles, as you're as you're watching this, um, I'm just thinking too, you know, how exciting this must be for you to watch it, um, knowing how much <laughs> this means to you um, and, and how invested you are uh, in space and what it could mean moving forward. Um, as we've got these, you know, 15 minutes, a little bit more now with that hold. I mean, what are you? What are you most interested in today with this particular launch, Miles? Well, I, I'm, I'm interested in it being a safe and enjoyable ride, number one. Mm -hmm. And I want to, the, the thrill of seeing Bill Shatner do this is great. I will point out that there is a character in the Star Trek series by the name of Miles O'Brien. And so uh, um, <laughs> I, I guess they stole my name. Uh, so I, I really feel like I should be on board with him as a part of the Star Trek theme launch, but somehow mm. my invitation got lost in the mail. Uh, I do think, you know, each of these flights incrementally as they pull them off safely, we all watch it, we all embrace it, uh, we all have some fun with it. Each of them leads us to making yeah. this more of a truly routine thing, I think. Mm -hmm. Uh, by the way, Miles, d don't try to squeeze in on my very public campaign to get an invitation <laughs> on space. Uh, just, I don't just know if you either. caught that. Jim has been Me putting first. a hard I press on the last few days. I've heard Me a first bit about Miles. Then Miles, Maybe although Miles clearly, Miles clearly deserves it more, more than me. Um, <laughs> Chris Hadfield, again, you, you've been on multiple space missions. Uh, for folks at home, you know, we're used to flight checks, right? Every time you take off in a commercial airliner, the pilot's up front. They're running through a flight check, and you might have experienced a delay before as they check for a, you know, warning light that is on, etc. I just imagine you might say that the flight checks, Commander Hatfield, are on steroids for, for space flight because it's just by its nature a higher tech and more difficult thing to do. Yeah, their, their launch control team is sitting there. And earlier when we had the sort of uh, vague hold, there, you know, there's pressurized hydrogen, which is the molecules are so tiny that mm. it's really hard to build seals that'll hold. Pressurized oxygen. And, and they're looking at, you know, how all of those things are, are functioning as the gases get further down the pipes and closer to the engine. They are the folks that are really working on those close in checks. Um, Stand by for a moment. Special special message from Mission Control to the crew. Dear NS18 travelers, you have probably been playing this moment over and over in thoughts and also quite often in real life in the case of Mr. Shatner. But now the moment is there, the moment you're really going to space, and I can assure you that it will be better than your best imagination. No day passes by that we don't look back on this journey without having a smile from ear to ear. Have a safe flight and enjoy. Greetings from your youngest predecessor, Oliver Damon. Oliver Damon. From the last flight. Oh. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Astronaut, New Shepard astronaut Wally Funk says, I hope this flight will be the most fantastic experience of your life as it was mine. Take time to enjoy every aspect of this journey. From liftoff to touchdown. From liftoff to touchdown. Jeff has done a magnificent job of ensuring the smoothest, most memorable ride, and Kevin and Sarah are top-notch instructors. Becoming part of the Blue Origin family is an honor like none other I have received. Together, let's cross new boundaries and set new records. I, I, I will be watching your liftoff with great enthusiasm and sending my best wishes. Godspeed, Audrey, Bill, Glenn, and Chris. Much love, Wally. Much love, Wally. Oh, we love you, Wally. New Shepard astronaut Demo, whose uh, real name is Mark Bezos, has this to say. You lucky bastards. It was only 10 weeks ago that I was sitting where you are, watching the countdown clock, full of anticipation and excitement, eager to feel a rumble of liftoff and the majesty of weightlessness. The depth of my desire to fly again is hard to express, 
verse that allow me to quote from the classic of the great American songbook, Mr. Spaceman, with lyrics by William Shatner. Hey, Mr. Spaceman, won't you please take me along? I won't do anything wrong. Hey, Mr. Spaceman, won't you please take me along for a ride? Godspeed, New Shepherd. I can't wait to hear your stories. Mark. So you're just hearing messages there uh, from members of the last uh, New Shepherd launch. Uh, you heard a, a note from Oliver Damon, who at 18 was the youngest to go up, saying, uh, now is the moment. Now the moment is there. I can assure you it will never be better uh, than your best imagination. And Wally Funk who at 82 finally achieved her dream of going up into space. Well, now she'll no longer be the oldest person mm -hmm. uh, to achieve that. William Shatner, of course, at 90. She said, it's the most fantastic experience of your life. I hope it is as it was mine. Remember, she was, she was part of a group of, of female pilots. They were testing to see if women were fit for space travel. She ultimately never went. And there was so much made of her journey at the time and the dream that that you know really achieved for her all of what she had done in her life was really something and then we also heard from mark bezos of course uh brother of jeff who said you lucky bastards uh he is clearly a little jealous this morning mm -hmm. jim uh really enjoyed his trip 10 weeks ago uh, and he wants them all to know that he thinks he should be there with them this morning um, so those messages uh being sent, being uh, being read to uh, to this crew as they prepare uh, and yeah. as they wait for that launch, Jim. No question. Uh, and again, that holds still in place, uh, coming up above eight minutes. Uh, uh, other than that, the crew is in that capsule there. You can see, I believe that's William Shatner through that window there. Uh, we're awaiting updates to see when, if and when, it'll be taken off hold once again. While we do await those updates, we're going to take a short break. Please stay with us. We're going to be right back. It's beautiful out here. Sure is. And I earn 5% cash back on travel purchased through Chase with Chase Freedom Unlimited. That means that I earn 5% on our rental car, I earn 5% on our cabin. I mean, come on. Hello, cash back. Hello, Kevin Hart. I'm scared. <laughs> In a good way. I'm lying. Let's get inside. Earn big time with Chase Freedom Unlimited with no annual fee. How do you cash back? Chase, make more of what's yours. Live pictures here. Uh, we are waiting on the launch for Blue Origin. These pictures coming out of West Texas, of course. You see the clock stopped at exactly 15 minutes. Underneath it, you see the hold clock there. This is the second hold that we have seen this morning. Uh, clock ticking there at about 13 minutes for this particular hold. The first one we were told was due to uh, some vehicle readiness checks. Uh, we will see what we learn about this one. Waiting for some more information from Blue Origin on that. But the capsule is loaded. Uh, the crew is in, including, of course, William Shatner. Uh, there we see uh, Mission Control, essentially. We've been listening in a little bit to their communications as well, Jim, as we wait for some more information at this point um, about that hold. Back with us now, Chris Hadfield, former commander of the International Space Station, Miles O'Brien, uh, of course, uh, CNN space analyst, as well as Jonathan Martin, uh, who is an astrophysicist. But we have Kristen Fisher on the ground, McDowell, Jonathan McDowell. We have Kristen Fisher on the ground. Uh, the, the company was, it seemed, deliberately vague about the pr reason for the previous launch hold, just stating the phrase vehicle readiness. Uh, have you gotten, has the company provided any more information about this hold? No new information whatsoever from the company. Uh, of course, holds not uncommon, but uh, you have to wonder what exactly the holdup is here. But I just can't stop thinking about what it must be like for William Shatner sitting inside this capsule right now. I mean, here is someone who has spent so much of his life, so much of his life has been so closely tied to space, his life, his legacy, and yet he's never actually been to space. Now here he is just minutes away from that becoming a reality. And you know, when there was this first wind delay, he talked about how much that delay extended his feelings of excitement and sheer terror. So you have to imagine 
imagine that those feelings are even more heightened now that he's actually sitting on top mm -hmm. of this, uh, essentially what's a controlled explosive about to launch him and three others into space. And when they get there, they're going to be going uh, about 62 miles up. And William Shatner and the other crew members said that they want to spend their precious four minutes or so of weightlessness uh, with their faces pressed against the windows of this capsule, really taking in the views of planet Earth. That is what the crew of this new Shepard mission says that they hope to do if and when they finally get up into space, if this countdown clock ever starts going again. Yeah. And then they will fall back down to Earth with the assistance, of course, of gravity and the assistance of those three big parachutes. But you know, Jim, one other very important thing to point out here, in addition to a rocket launch, which should be going in about 15 minutes if this hold ever stops, uh, we're also going to get to see a booster landing, which was once described as one of the rarest of beasts. Just until a few years ago, this is something that was truly the stuff of science fiction, much much like uh, Captain Kirk and Star Trek and the Starship Enterprise. Yep. And yet now, one more example of science fiction becoming reality with companies like Blue Origin and Elon Musk's SpaceX uh, coming up with this incredible technology to reuse these boosters to land them back on planet Earth and ultimately make space flight much more affordable yeah. for everyday people and everyday customers, Jim. Kristen Fisher, thanks so much. Uh, we should note the company has not explained the reason for this second uh, delay uh, as they did not provide much detail on, on, on the first. And Erica, as we've noted uh, prior, uh, it, it's a private company, not subject to the same standards that we'd see from, say, a NASA in, in a similar situation. It's true, but it definitely makes for a different experience as you're watching this. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Miles, I'm, I'm thinking back to if we think about, you know, other launches, even that I'm even remembering the final shuttle launch, which I have to say I was lucky enough to cover. You think about all of the communication that you do have and that window that you have uh, that comes from the audio that you hear. This is yet another reminder of just how different this space exploration, this private space exploration is, Miles. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's hard to be a space reporter these days, I think. You know, at the risk of sounding like the old guy on the porch. In my day, we used to know some things, you know? And, uh, I, you know, I remember when I was, uh, a after I left CNN, I was on the NASA Advisory Council for a little bit while, and uh, I was pushing NASA to insist that uh, SpaceX and Elon Musk open the doors a little more to uh, data and to mm. the flight loops, as we call it, the, the communications among the team in yeah. advance of the launches, because those launches, after all, are paid for by taxpayers. Now, in this case today, there's no taxpayer money involved in this launch at all, and Jeff Bezos can release as much or as little information as he likes. Maybe yep. reporters need to get uh, prime access to information <laughs> for a little extra money. I don't know. That's a fair point. And, and by the way, I, this may be notable. The, those vehicles you see going away from the launch site there, we've just been told that the tower crew has now left uh, the launch site there, may be significant. And there you go. The hold appears to have just been lifted there. We're back to T minus uh, below 15 minutes now for launch. So the second uh, hold on this launch lifted now. Uh, Commander Hadfield, I don't want to jinx anything. Right, because other questions could come up between now and then. Uh, but this is progress. Uh, tell us the significance of that, and, and does it look likely now that the launch will go off? Yeah, whenever you see a hold that's at an even number, like 15 minutes, then you know it's yeah. a planned hold. And what they were waiting for was just, just like we did for my two space shuttle launches, you have to wait for the closeout crew to gather all their stuff, to get it, get back in their vehicle, and get far enough away so that if the rocket explodes, they know that they're at least going to be safe. And that's exactly what just happened. You could actually see the two trucks sort of pull over there on that wide concrete apron. So they were, they were just following their procedures. And today it took them, you know, 15 minutes to do that final closeout. But the important part is, you know, the clock is now ticking through yeah. 14 minutes. And in 14 minutes, my buddy Bill... <laughs> Captain Kirk is about to go to space, and I, I, I'm, I'm really with him mentally. Uh, what, yeah. a, what a cool experience for such a guy. You know, your buddy Bill, um, for folks who are just joining us, you two go back a little ways. Uh, you know, you communicated uh, while you were up at the ISS, and, and as I understand, you've been texting uh, leading up to this launch. Uh, he has been very public about how excited he is, but also, you know, he said he's even a little terrified. He's comfortable but uncomfortable. Um, 
How do you think he's feeling in this moment? Mm -hmm. He, 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 if he wasn't uh, uncomfortable and slightly terrified, then he just wouldn't know what was going on. I mean, uh, what's really about to happen is an enormous bomb is going to wow. ignite underneath them. But it's a bomb that we've learned how to control so that the energy comes out over about a two minute period out the nozzles out the back. So if you're sitting you know, with three friends and three new friends sitting on a bomb, uh, waiting and trusting engineers that you've never met to have done their math right, of mm. course he's gonna be a little worried. But at some point you've just gotta go, okay, this is about to happen and I'm along for the ride. And now, as you say, I'm gonna put a bunch of nose marks on the window as I, as I see what this new view's gonna show me. And, and you know, Bill's thinking, okay, how am I gonna get out of my seat on time? And how am I gonna make the most and maybe do a couple flips mm. in weightlessness? I th he's probably got all those little gremlins of thoughts running around his 90 year old head right now. But it's a great have to do point. The flip. <laughs> you do, for sure. Uh, it's a, it's a great point about the technology, the super technology of space, right? This is a this is a controlled, a sustained controlled explosion, right? Over many minutes to get that rocket up there. Uh, you mentioned his friends, William Shatner's friends, uh, and I want to get your impressions of them, Jonathan McDowell, because I had to interrupt you a couple times as we got updates from Mission Control there. Audrey Powers, I mean, a flight controller for NASA uh, for some 2,000 hours. She now involved uh, directly in the safety protocols for getting this into space. Dr. Chris ba Boschheisen, he also served in NASA's Ames Research Center. Uh, he now works for a company called Planet Lab but also Glenn DeVries, he's with Metadata Solutions. So, so from your perspective, you said earlier, astrophysicists, they know these people. Tell us why you know these other members of the crew. Well, you know, the, the great thing about the space community in, in these days is that people do know each other. There's a whole generation that, that mm -hmm. grew up uh, with Chris and Audrey who networked uh, early in their careers and, and were inspired by the earlier generations of astronauts uh, uh, like Chris and Bernard. Uh, and, uh, and so they had this vision of really transforming space travel, making this new era where satellites are cheaper, launchers are cheaper, and ordinary people might be able to go to space. Uh, and so I think that, that everyone is, feels part of a family in that respect and so you know they're they're uh, they've been raring to go all their lives now they're managing to do this we feel like we're a bit along there with them uh mm. these last minute holds you know they're frustrating uh, uh they go back to uh the beginning of the space age right when alan shepherd was had a last minute hold on his launch and he was uh frustratingly saying to mission control let's light this candle which mm. we saw earlier and on the gangway. Uh, um, so I think that's what they're feeling right now. Let's light this candle and uh, let's get on our, our ride that we've been preparing all our lives for. Kristen, you were pointing out earlier, which I think is so interesting, that in the U.S. this will make for six, I think you said six crewed launches in the last six months. And that's an important milestone as we're looking more at, you know, private companies and space exploration and how, how the industry, how the game, frankly, is changing. It's just remarkable how quickly it, it has all come together, right? I mean, for people that don't follow this closely, it's like, wow, this just came out of nowhere. But this is a moment, uh, this year, 2021, is a moment that the uh, commercial space industry has really been building towards for decades. SpaceX, Blue Origin, they've both been around for almost 20 years. And now within literally the last year for Blue Origin, uh, just the last three months, they are finally uh, really beginning to send NASA astronauts in SpaceX's case and uh, paying customers in Blue Origin's case up into space. And so, uh, you know, you heard Chris, one of the crew members on this flight, talk about how he really felt like it was not fair to call this crew tourists. He says, mm. we still believe that we are pioneers because we are at the very beginning of this new wave of space tourism. But make no mistake, he believes that 2021 is the year that is going to go down in history as the year when humanity really began stepping off this planet uh, on mass or at scale. And it's just the very beginning of it, but it is a very important milestone. And you also have, uh, you know, uh, what we just saw. And I actually, I believe we are beginning those final checks right now. If you guys want to hear the mission control going through all the various Kristen, systems. And we're going to listen in, Kristen. Uh, I think we're going to listen into those right now uh, from mission control. I guess that's it, huh? 
As you heard it, we are go for launch, go for second human flight. I am so excited. And there we just heard it, go for launch, Jim. Yep. I think uh, I heard William Shatner. I, I, I'm, I think I recognize his voice there say, saying something to, to the effect of, uh, I guess we're ready to go. Uh, listen, they're about to rocket into space at, uh, in excess of 2,200 miles an hour. They're going to go 62 miles high. Uh, Chris Hatfield, Commander Hatfield, we have the advantage of someone to speak to who's experienced that very force. Uh, I felt butterflies. What are the butterflies like in a launch? Uh, they take you over. Um, I felt so aware and, and so excited. I, I'd gotten over the fear part of it years before because, you know, it, this was a thing that I was definitely going to do. Now my job was to get good at it. But on that morning, you're hyper aware. You know the moments in your life when something really significant is happening and you're like on super record mode because because everything that you think about, none of them are thinking about, you know, paying their taxes or their car insurance or what they're going to do a week from Tuesday. Uh, right now, their whole existence is uh, the next 15 minutes of their life and so uh, so that's what they're feeling you're you're you're, you're tingling with the excitement of it and, and and the anticipation of it and the palpable danger yeah. of it and you know mm -hmm. I had stuff to do flying helping to fly the space shuttle but uh, but but these folks you know they they are uh, they're sitting by their window anticipating mm -hmm. this event along for an amazing ride um, Dr. Bernard Harris, uh, former NASA astronaut as well, was with us a short time ago. And one of the things that he mentioned, I think it was Dr. Harris, so correct me if I was wrong there, um, but talking about as you're waiting in this moment, you know, even songs that, that, that would be played to pump you up. Um, you know, Commander Hatfield, was there a, was there a certain tune? <laughs> um, I, I, I grew up, I'm Canadian like, like Bill Shatner, and I grew up with, uh, with Gordon Lightfoot. And there's a song he wrote called If You Could Read My Mind, Love. And it's so beautiful and lilting and it soars up and then comes back down again. And it's a really thoughtful uh, sort of philosophical set of lyrics. So I was lying on my back in, in the same launch pad that Yuri Gagarin launched from uh, mm. in, in 60 years ago and, and listening to uh, If You Could Read My Mind, Love. And it was mm. soothing for me. I, I don't know what's, what music's playing in these four folks' heads. Well, I, I hope someone's thinking Rocket Man. Uh, you, you have to imagine. Uh, Miles O'Brien, we are T minus under six minutes now to launch. Describe what happens in the next uh, less than six minutes here. Well, uh, we're going to unleash a lot of power from that liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. Uh, the uh, fuel is is quite volatile. It's you know when you think about what rockets do, they take the coldest thing we know of, which is liquid hydrogen, uh, run it through a bunch of turbo pumps that are hyper fast, can fill up swimming pools in the blink of an eye, and then turn that into uh, to, to fire. And all that's happening in short order in a short, uh, confined space. And when you really start to think about that, you wonder how that happens at all. And, mm. and frankly, if I'm Bill Shatner right now, I'm not trying to think too much about that because it's much easier to fly in the Enterprise, which was, after all, a, a cardboard model shot against a, a black <laughs> screen in Hollywood, right? And, you know, I, I am, I got to say a, a one word here about the intersection of Hollywood and reality here. You know, for years and years and years, people would come and visit NASA, and they would say, so where's the zero gravity room? You know, where we mm. do weightless, that doesn't exist. And why don't you go at warp speed? In other words, the reality never was as good as what we saw on the silver screen. And here we're having this confluence point where Hollywood meets the reality, and the reality is still a long way behind warp speed. Um, mm. You know, we saw last week or a week or so ago when the Inspiration4 crew went to space, uh, one of the crew members was sick for most of the occasion. The toilet didn't work so well. It's not as utopian as yeah. Star Trek, which was, after all, utopia, where humans didn't kill humans and they didn't even have money. So uh, reality meets Hollywood here, and it's we're still trying to have uh, the uh, realities uh, catch up to the science, science fiction vision. Having yeah. Shatner here at this pivot point, maybe that'll change the trajectory. It's such, it's such an interesting point. Uh, we are now uh, under four minutes, uh, if my eyes have not failed me, because that screen's a little far away. Kristen, mm. as we, you know, 
taking what Miles was just saying there too about you know how different this is from what people may imagine sort of like probably how a doctor feels about watching a medical show um, this is still a really important moment and I find it interesting that these last two flights right are breaking their own records we had Wally Funk mm -hmm. who at 82 you know was the oldest that we have William Shatner at 90 um, how much of that interest right is coming from the way that these launches have been crewed well Sorry, I think Kristen, it's very screen. deliberate right these these billionaire owners of these companies Elon Musk Jeff Bezos they are acutely aware of the criticism that has been coming their way from from much of the population accusing them of just going on these joy rides into space uh, and just taking money from these very very wealthy patrons so they are very deliberately trying to cast these crews if you will uh, with somebody like William Shatner who would get a lot of people excited with someone like Willie Wally Funk who so deserved a seat on there as one of those Mercury 13 uh, astronauts, so to speak, who never got to fly in space. Uh, so Jeff Bezos, I believe, very aware uh, of the criticism that's coming his way. But he believes, along with Elon Musk and Richard Branson, uh, that they are doing something that is ultimately going to better all of humankind. It's just these very wealthy patrons that they believe have to pave the way. And one measure of the fact that this is a business as we approach T minus two minutes to, to launch is all the various ways to observe it. Uh, this is a drone shot uh, around. Yeah. Uh, y y you know, th this is a company wants to show it as it happens. What's happening right now, in fact, I can think you could see it there in this shot, is uh, the tower connection to the capsule to the rocket is being pulled back. These are all part of the rocket's built-in checks and steps pre-launch. Again, as we approach just about uh, a minute and a half here. Uh, Commander Hatfield, what's happening inside that capsule right now as these final checks go into place? Well, all eight eyeballs in there have just flicked over to watch that, uh, that walkway pull away. Because this this is for real now. This is no longer talking about it. Uh, this is this is opening night, and uh, so everybody's watching that and and, uh, and recognizing. Wow, I got one minute left on Earth. Uh, hopefully, everything's about to go well. All right, let's listen in to Mission Control as we go through the final in three, T two, minus one. one. Minute. T minus one minute. You heard it there. Let's listen. And there you can just see slightly there the gimbling engine at the base of the rocket. All right, everybody, Chris Boss has Glenn DeBreeze, Audrey Piles, and William Shatner are about to go where very few humans have gone before. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to launch this rocket. Godspeed, New Shepard. Minus 10, 9, 8, 7, Six, five, four, command engine start. Two, one. Speedometer. They are gaining speed on their climb to space. We have confirmed max Q. This is when the, ma the, the aerodynamic stresses on the vehicle were at their maximum.
you again, everybody, for joining us live for New Shepard's second human flight with Audrey Powers, William Shatner, our customers, Glenn DeVries and Chris Bosshausen on board. They are well on their way to space so far. A nominal flight, a clean burn on our Blue Engine 3. New Shepard giving them a beautiful flight to space this morning. The rocket is climbing towards an altitude. We're aiming just over the Kármán line, the internationally recognized line of space of 100 kilometers. That is about 328,000 feet and a gorgeous view down the rocket. And now we've had main engine cut off. The BE-3 engine has shut off. And in just a moment, we're going to separate the capsule from the booster. And at that point, our astronauts will have the opportunity to get out of their harnesses and enjoy the beauties of zero G. Let's wait to listen. And there you can see a clean separation between the capsule and the booster. And there you can see the capsule from the top of the booster. They are continuing their ascent over the Kármán line. You'll know when they hit apogee, when the speed hits zero. And there they are, over 328,000 feet, over 100 kilometers. Welcome to space. The newest astronauts on board our crew capsule. And there they are, they have hit, just about hit their apogee at about 351,000 feet. And while we don't have apogee, I can just imagine Jackie, they are having the time of their lives. Thank you again, everybody, for joining us live from West Texas. So far, a nominal flight for our second human crew. So exciting, Jackie, to have sent Captain Kirk himself, William Shatner, to space. I cannot wait to hear his commentary upon return, as well as our two customers, Chris Bosshausen from Australia, to all the fans turning, tuning in from uh, down under. A big shout out to you guys, as well as Glenn DeVries and our very own Audrey Powers. They are coming back home. The booster, of course, is going to beat the capsule back home. It is more aerodynamically shaped, of course, at the base of the, the capsule. It's kind of a, a blunt end, so it's less aerodynamic. What we're going to see coming up shortly is at the top of the rocket, we have the ring fin. The, uh, the, there's uh, some what we call the pie fins that extend from the ring fin, uh, as well as the drag brakes. The, the, uh, the pie fins, the wedge fins, help stabilize the vehicle, uh, like kind of like the feathers at the back of an arrow. And then uh, you will also see the drag brakes. And as you mentioned, Jackie, it cuts the velocity dramatically. There you can see the wedge fins are out.
Here we see the descent. We are going to expect the BE-3 engine to relight just at about 3,600 feet or about 1,200 meters above ground level. Let's wait for that now. The drag brakes have deployed. And here we come, New Shepard. <laughs> a beautiful flight to space for our second human crew. Wow, I, I, that gets me every time we do this live down here in Texas. The sonic boom is so cool. Drag brakes are folding back in, as have the wedge fins. Just looks like you could uh, fuel her up and go again. What do you think, Jackie? And even when you know to expect the sonic boom, it still catches you off guard every time. Talk about a rumble. A beautiful sight of our new Shepard rocket there in the West Texas desert. But of course, the show is not over. The capsule is descending. We are waiting for first the drogue break, excuse me, the drogue chutes to deploy. Those are very much like the guide parachutes. They will subsequently be uh, followed by the, uh, the main parachutes that will fully, that will full, first reef and then fully inflate. And there go the drogue parachutes. And here come the mains. Whew, what a flight. <laughs> You can already start to hear the cheers from outside the, our, uh, our stage here in West Texas. I just threw a piece of fog call up. I can go look out the window, Audrey. Oh, yeah, yeah, I see it. I can't see the boost, though. Where is it? from the cover. It's going to rotate. I'm going to find that spot and take it home. How about that, guys? How about that, guys? That was unlike anything they described. All right, we, we, got, <laughs> we got less than a thousand feet. All right. Great. Let's take oh. it And here comes our crew back into the desert. Everybody. Newest astronauts, 596, 97, 98, and 99. <laughs> That's unlike anything you'll ever feel. Ever feel. Stand by touchdown. Stand by touchdown. Stand by touchdown. And capsule touchdown. Welcome back. The newest astronauts, Audrey Powers, William Shatner, our customers, Glenn DeVries, and Chris Poshausen. What a day for you. Welcome back. I cannot wait to talk to them, Jackie, and just get what they experienced up there this morning. What a clean and beautiful flight from the rocket for our astronauts. What an absolutely stunning flight. And I also loved hearing that audio of them on their way back about how this experience was for them. And I can't wait to hear their stories. Well, you, you heard William Shatner say, this is like nothing I've ever experienced before. So coming from a man who in theory has experienced space who for has decades. gone warp speed and traveled the entire intergalactic universe. <laughs> this was like nothing he's ever seen before. What a day for our astronauts. So now our team is preparing landing safety operations and recovery of our astronauts from the crew capsule. We'll be on the ground at the landing site to follow the action in just a bit. Maybe even talk to the world's newest astronauts. 
Some absolutely breathtaking stuff. And I'll note that you're going to see our, uh, the recovery team show up very shortly because we actually send them out before the capsule has landed because through our modeling, we get very, by now, we're very, very good at analyzing where the capsule is going to come down. Very given where precise we know on that lane. Exactly, where, where the winds are. And so we're going to see the recovery team come out there. And of course, they will also be joined by some of their friends and family to watch as they emerge from the capsule. Let's check out these beautiful shots of our four astronauts there in the Texas desert after having gone up over the Carmen line and back. And hello, everyone. I am Kate Baldwin. We are beginning with breaking news. Just a beautiful sight to see. Star Trek actor William Shatner making history as the oldest person ever to go to space. Just over 10 minutes ago, as we all watched it play out, the 90-year-old and three crewmates blasted off aboard Blue Origin's New Shepard rocket which took billionaire Jeff Bezos into space just in July. The rocket soared up to about three times the speed of sound, reached an altitude of more than 60 miles high, achieving a few beautiful yet brief minutes of weightlessness. And then, as we all just saw, landing back to Earth once again just moments ago. Shatner's flight is now the sixth human spaceflight mission this year carrying civilians and we all saw it play out together there's much more to come as we've seen let me begin our coverage with cnn's kristen fisher she's live at the launch site and has been covering all of this in texas you know kristen we know if pat as we saw with the last um the last flight there's going to be videos that they're that are going to be coming out and we're going to see a lot more but it looked flawless Blue Origin has to be very, very happy about this mission. It looked flawless. Uh, we'll cert certainly get to hear a bit more about that, and we should get some of that video later today of William Shatner and the rest of the crew floating around during those precious four minutes of weightlessness. But, but I tell you what, Kate, you know, William Shatner may be the star of the show today, but that booster return just gave him a run for his money. I'm not talking about the capsule landing. I'm talking about the booster that propelled the capsule into space. If you've never seen one before, and very few people have, because up until just a few years ago, that was the stuff of science fiction. It is truly incredible to watch this massive booster just literally fall out of the sky. And then just when you think it's going to crash on the desert floor, it fires off uh, its thrusters, balances itself out, and then gently brings itself down to a perfect landing after you hear a sonic boom. It's just incredible to watch. As I said, that was science fiction until just a few years ago. Blue Origin, uh, SpaceX made it possible. And now you have this other science fiction becoming reality, the original Captain Kirk finally, officially becoming an astronaut, Kate. Absolutely. Stick with me, Kristen. Let me bring in Miles O'Brien on this. Miles, I, I will say, watching that booster, it really wobbles f at first. I mean, it's unbelievable that it even corrects itself. But what are your thoughts on seeing this? It's scary to watch, isn't it? And cool, <laughs> too. You know, I mean, uh, this is why they call it rocket science, right? I mean, you've got to, you, you know, if you've ever tried to balance a broomstick, you know, on your finger, that's kind of what's happening with a lot more <laughs> physics involved, of course. But, you know, it, it, this is what it, it, what's so important about this is when you think about all the things we threw away on our way to space, uh, huge chunks of the Apollo, of course, which was not reusable at all. The space shuttle aimed to be reusable, but it was not really reusable in a very practical way. The solid rocket boosters would be fished out of the water, but it was a lot of work getting them back ready to fly. And the orbiter itself had those very fragile tiles on uh, the surface, which required a ton of work. All of that added to the expense. Imagine if every time we flew a 737 halfway across the country, they threw away the airplane. We wouldn't <laughs> be doing that very much, would we? So now we're in a position, uh, the likes of Bezos and Musk uh, have uh, created uh, vehicles that are really reusable in a, in a uh, economical way. And that drives down the cost significantly. And that's why those of us who are in space are watching this all happen, this billionaire space race and, and the famous people going, are, are cheering it on because what it is doing is it is driving that very technology we're talking about. Absolutely. And you saw the ground crew running around getting thumbs up from, uh, from all of them on board. And, and, and 
Miles, just you were talking about just how this is, it's exciting to see, it's exhilarating to watch. We, we all, I mean, we can all say that very honestly. And it's also exciting to see in just the progress with the technology and what this means, what this could mean. Um, I'm also excited to hear just how they describe it. We, I think it was William Shatner's voice we heard in just like a brief bit of audio as they were descending when he said, unlike anything to describe, um, you're probably the closest, closest thing I can uh, ask to, what do you want to hear from them? I can't wait to hear how they describe it. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting. It's such a tiny little, you know, Bush Muse, a tiny little taste of space. Yeah. You know, uh, the Enterprise was out there for five years, according, <laughs> according to this show, right? And so, you know, he was in space in an increment of time that is less between less time than the time between commercials on a Star Trek. So uh, it was a taste, a tiny little taste. And the question is, at 90, is uh, Bill Shatner ready to go for more? Would he like to get an orbital mission, maybe over at Elon Musk's shop on SpaceX? Uh, I got to tell you, I want to be that 90-year-old, though. Just the fact that he could climb the steps up to the launch platform, you know, he gets a, you know, Vulcan salute, I guess, for that one, right? You know? I, but, I will uh, say, yeah, it's hard. I was, uh, I, I, it's, the it, only thing I question here is that he's actually 90 years old, because from what we've seen, Miles, I mean, it's, maybe that's not. pretty maybe unreal. Maybe he's an android. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I like where we're heading with this. Um, from the unreal to the even yeah. more unreal um, and unbelievable. <laughs> but what, so we've now have, Bezos now has, we've now like these two, I'm going to call them missions, you know, these two missions. Um, with civilians on board. What, is it clear what was learned from the first to the second and what can be learned um, from this? Uh, you know, I, I think they've got a pretty robust system here. Uh, they, they built a, a pretty safe, you know, and I say this relatively speaking, you are, there's a lot of forces at play here and, and the plumbing has to work just right or you can have a, a, some real trouble. But you have a system there that, number one, it, it is only going to the very edge of space. To get to orbit is about 15 or 16 times more energy has to be put into the rocket. So, you know, we're in a different order of magnitude. Having said that, uh, it, it's got a robust system with a crew escape capability. The capsule could separate from the rocket itself when, when needed. And all of these things, everything they built hey, Miles, was built with the I'm orbital just gonna in jump in I'm just, I want to jump in and listen in. No, no, you're great. Let's listen in together. You see Jeff Bezos is there and you hear the cheers. Let's listen in. Again, thank you everybody for joining us live from West Texas at our launch site one. Our second human space flight crew has gone to space and back up over the Carmen line, just over 351,000 feet. We're awaiting Jeff Bezos, who is now opening the hatch.
There's Audrey Powers. A big hug from her sister. <laughs> Captain Kirk himself, the great William Shatner. Our customer, Chris Bosshouse, and the first full Australian citizen to go to space and back. And Glenn DeVries. Some big hugs from their loved ones. In a way, it's indescribable. That's what I thought. You have to work on it. It's so hard to describe. You have to work on it because not only is it different than what you thought, it happens so quickly. Well done. First time. You know what my my the impression I had that I never ex <laughs> expected to have <laughs> is you're shooting up. Oh, my God. Oh, God. Give and me a new bottle. Come here. Bottle. I want one. <laughs> I, I want to hear this. Here. You want a little of this? Hey. <laughs> Champagne showers have begun. Smiles all around. William Shatner taking in the moment clearly. <laughs> what you have done. If everybody in the world needs to be. Everybody in the world needs to see. The, uh, <laughs> It was unbelievable, unbelievable. I mean, you know, the, the little things of weightlessness. But to see the blue cover go whip by, and now you're staring into black. That's the thing. The covering of blue, this, this sheet, this blanket, this, com this comforter of blue that we have around. We think, oh, that's blue sky. And then suddenly you shoot through it all of a sudden, as though you whip off a sheet off you when you're asleep, and you're looking into blackness, into black ugliness. And you look down, and there's the blue down there, and the black up there, and it's... It's just, there is mother and earth and comfort, and there is, is there death? I don't know. Is that death? Is that the way death is? Whoop! And it's gone. Chase. It was so moving to me. This experience has been something unbelievable. You see, yeah, you know, uh, weightless, my stomach went up, and I, God, this is so weird, but not as weird as the covering of blue. This is what I never expected. Oh, it's one thing to say, oh, the sky and the thing and the fragile thing. It's all true. But what isn't true, what, what is unknown until you do it, is there's this pillow. There's this soft blue. Look at the beauty of that color. And it's so thin. And you're through it in an instant. It's what a how 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 thick is it? We know. I mean, the atmosphere. Is it a mile? Two no, miles? I mean, it's, I mean, it depends on how you measure because it thins out, but maybe 50 miles. Not but even. you're going yeah. 2,000 miles an hour, so you're through 50 miles, of whatever the mathematics are. Fast. Was. Yeah. Really you know, fast. it's like a beat and a beat, and suddenly you're through the blue. And, and you're into black, mm -hmm. and you're into uh, you know, it's uh, it's mysterious and galaxies and things. But what you see is black, and what you see down there is light, and that's the difference. And not to have this, you have done something. I mean, whatever those other guys are doing, what it, what isn't, they don't, I don't know about that. What you have given me is the most profound experience I can imagine. Uh, I'm so filled with emotion about what just happened. I, I just, it's extraordinary, extraordinary. I hope I never recover from this. I hope that I can uh, maintain what I feel now. I, I don't want to lose it. It's so, 
It's so much larger than, than me of life. And it hasn't got anything to do with the little green planet, the blue orb, and the, it has got anything to do with that. It has to do with the enormity and the quickness and the suddenness of life and death of the oh my God. It's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. Beautiful, yes, beautiful in its way, but... No, I mean your words. Oh, my words. It's just amazing. I don't know. I can't even begin to express what I, I, what I would love to do is to communicate as much as possible. The, the jeopardy, the... the, the, the the moment you see how vul the vulnerability of everything, it's so small. This air, which is keeping us alive, is, is thinner than your skin. It's it's a it's a it's a sliver. It's it's immeasurably small when you think in terms of the of the universe. It's a, it's not it's negligible. This air. Mars doesn't have it. Right there. N nothing. I mean, this and way. And when you think of way, carbon dioxide change to oxygen. And what is it? Twenty percent of some of that level that sustains our life. It's so thin. Mm -hmm. To 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 dirty it. I mean, that's another whole. And you shoot subject. through. It, what you were saying about shooting through it so fast, so quickly, fifty miles. Then you're of, just in black. You're, and you're in death. Yeah. In, in the moment this you, is life this is life and that's that and it's in in an instant you go wow that's death that's what i saw that's amazing that's amazing wow. i am i am overwhelmed i have no idea you know we were talking earlier before going well you know it's going to be different go, yeah it's going to, and you have whatever that phrase is you have that you have a different view of things uh, it doesn't begin to to uh, explain to, to to describe what what it, well for me i mean everybody's going to but, it, and this is now the commercial, it, everybody, it, it, it would be so important for everybody to have that experience through one means or another. I mean, maybe you could put it on 3D and <laughs> wear the goggles <laughs> and have that experience. I mean, that's, that this certainly is a technical possibility. But, but what you need also, we're lying there in... Yeah, and I'm thinking, listen, one delay after another delay, we're lying there. And I think, how do I feel? And I'm thinking, you know, I'm a little jittery here. And, and when they move the pins, oh, there's something in the engine. They found an anomaly in the engine. They found an anomaly in the engine. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to hold a little longer. Oh, you're going to hold a little longer. And I feel this, you know, the stomach, the the the, the, the biome inside. <laughs> and I'm thinking, okay, I'm, I'm thinking I'm a little nervous here. Another delay, I'm a little more nervous. And then the thing starts. By the way, the simulation is, they have to be warned. It's only a simulation. Mm -hmm. Everything else is much more. Doesn't powerful. capture. Doesn't capture the the and besides which the jeopardy. Bang! This thing hits. You go. Oh, you know, <laughs> that wasn't anything like the simulation. The G forces. And you're stepping in. What, what's going to happen to yeah. me? Am I going to be able to survive the G forces? <laughs> you feel that? Yeah, Am I going to survive it? Yeah. And then I think, good lord, that. Uh, you know, just getting up there. <laughs> This is the hardest part of the mission. <laughs> Thank Phil, you. you're amazing. You're an amazing person. I am, sir. Thank you. Audrey, you are so Good deserving job. of this. Thank you. You've worked so hard in this program, and all your life, you've been dreaming of this. Isn't that true? What a gift. Sorry, these things are tricky. <laughs> I can see, I have some more sympathy for Jeff Ashby now. <laughs> <laughs> Poor guy, he had to do it in front of a big crowd. It's just that the Nomex is very tough. Oh, that's true. It's like really fights you. There we go, I heard it, I heard it. That snap. Congratulations. Jeff, <laughs> thanks so much. Okay, guys, we have...
we're astronauts before you. That was absolutely amazing. As Jeff said, we've got four astronauts before you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today for Blue Origin's second human right. flight. <clears throat> of course, there, and, and there you have it. Well There's going to be much more video to come. Let me bring in Kristen Fisher. Kristen, do we have kind of the official stats now on? We've got the emotion and then the big numbers. How did this all go down? Well, you know, Kate, I think it's safe to say that William Shatner experienced the overview effect, right? This experience that astronauts talk about when uh, they see planet Earth for the first time and how deeply and profoundly it changes them. Very clearly, William Shatner experiencing that right there. And you know, I, I just have to say, this is what space tourism is all about. Giving people like William Shatner and everyday folks who walk on planet Earth the chance to experience what William Shatner just did. And we may not be able to put it into words as well as he did, but what he said right there is so profound. He said, everybody in the world needs to see it. It was unbelievable. And so that is really at the core of what a lot of these private spaceflight companies are trying to do, like Blue Origin. They're trying to get other people to experience this in the hopes that when they come back to planet Earth, that they'll be able to do things in their lives to make the world a bit better place. But I just have to go back through some of these incredible lines that William Shatner had. He told Jeff Bezos, you have given me the most profound experience. I am so filled with emotion about what just happened. I hope I never recover from this. I don't want to lose it. Um, you know, there are so many people who go into space who are skilled in so many different areas. They're brilliant scientists, mathematicians, engineers, test pilots, doctors. Uh, but William Shatner was just able to put that experience into words that I don't know. I don't think I've ever heard any astronaut quite capture that way. And I know there's going to be a big debate about are these four uh, crew members, are they now officially astronauts? Well, they crossed the Kármán line. Uh, you just saw the ceremony, Blue Origin giving them their pins. The company certainly believes they're astronauts. Uh, but, you know, I think William Shatner, uh, during his interview with Erica Hill earlier this week, he said something else that was pretty profound. He said, you know, Maybe you don't call me an astronaut with a capital A, but he believes that he's a, a, an astronaut with a with a lowercase a, kind of a, a a nod to the fact that there are still professional astronauts, and he was really just along for the ride. But uh, wow, what what a moment, um, and and what a neat experience that we got to watch that interaction between Jeff Bezos, uh, who just got to launch his childhood hero into space, uh, and William Shatner thanking him for what he described as the most profound and unbelievable experience of his life. And that's really saying something for 90-year-old William Shatner, one of the most famous actors on the planet, has led just uh, one of the most interesting lives out of anybody out there. For him to say that this had that impact on him, uh, wow, just imagine Imagine what, what you or I might experience if we had the opportunity to go up one day, Kate. Yeah, I would, I would hope I would be even a fraction of as articulate and poetic as William Shatner has been in the last couple of minutes. Let me bring in Nichelle Turner. She, of course, is a dear friend and co-host of Entertainment Tonight. Nichelle, yes. William Shatner, I, I'm, I am <laughs> profoundly more, even more interested in... Yeah this extraordinary human being. What do yeah. you think of this? Well, first of all, you guys have been calling him 90 years old, and I think we all see this morning that he is 90 years young, and what a life that, that he has lived. I mean, this is art imitating life in the most beautiful way. Uh, the man is a wordsmith, and I think he wrapped up this experience better than anyone could. You know, on, on Star Trek, Captain Kirk used to say, risk is our business. And I think that that has never been truer for William Shatner until today. You know, Kate, he did release a scheduled tweet during the mission when he was up in space. And I just want to read a little bit of that tweet to you. He said, I do not know what I may appear to the world 
But to myself, I seem to have been only like a boy playing on the seashore. And he goes on for a little bit, and he ends the tweet by saying, the great ocean of truth lay all undiscovered before me with a rocket ship. So, you know, he was thinking about this in the most poetic way uh, before this before this mission even, even happened. Then when he came down and to have the words that he did, I mean, was just really amazing. And we did hear him, you know, in the middle of the mission say that he's never experienced anything like this before. And he said he doesn't ever want to recover from this. I think that he will never recover from this. And I think that, that he is all the better for that. What a life lived, 90 years. And then to cap it off at being 90 and doing what he did this morning. I mean, I was sitting here through that whole entire mission just saying, wow, wow. I had no words because it was one of the most beautiful things that I think uh, I've ever seen. Absolutely. And we're playing the video from the moment he left the capsule. And you really can see, you know, how moved and, you know, profoundly emotional he really was. What is, I mean, honestly, Nichelle, I'm, I was, I was struck before William Shatner went into space with how hysterical he was. His interview yeah. it, it, with yeah. Anderson had me on the floor that he did last week. And now I, I, I don't even know, I don't even know what to say. I'm, it, it's, what is it about this man, this cap, the original Captain Kirk, this actor that has captivated the imagination and Star Trek itself, that's captivated the imagin imagination of, de of generations of people? Absolutely. I mean, he was one of the originators of swag, if we're being honest. You know, back it, six decades ago when he was uh, playing Captain Kirk. And he came on our screen as this man of bravado, this man of risk, you know, and, and that's who we thought he was. And then we get to know William Shatner, and he is this man of hilarity, and he has these amazing words. And it just almost kind of confirmed that hero status that we all wanted to have for him for so long. So to see this career span six decades for him, to see him win Grammys, to have these spoken word albums, to kind of more from Captain Kirk into this man and then to see him have that full circle moment today it's I mean it's almost indescribable he trail he he was a trailblazer on television doing a lot of things first he was the first to have an interracial kiss on television with my namesake Nichelle Nichols Lieutenant Uhura you know he really kind of broke ground in a lot of ways so now in his real life uh, to break ground in a way that kind of um, melds him back into Captain Kirk, I think it's something that we're all sitting in awe of this morning. Kate, I, I, I'm not even sure if that made sense. I was trying to be as astute as him, but <laughs> you just can't. You no. just, I want <laughs> him when I grow up, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. No, it, to, what you said totally makes sense. And I'm glad one of us is making sense as I've been just kind of watching this in awe. Miles, but you said come back. all of this. I was listening it, to Miles and, yeah. I, and trying to kind of take in everything he was saying because it's definitely an experience, even for us who are sitting at home watching it. Yeah, and Miles, you describe this so well. I mean, where do you want to take this? What are you thinking about this now? Where, there's, there's the, there are two things that are both very real. There is this really beautiful, profound human experience that William Shatner has described in a way that no one else has, Miles, as you've said. And there's also then the technical aspect of like, what does this mean in the grander, greater scheme of things, right? Yeah, you know, uh, it, all the uh, all the plumbing worked, all the electronics worked, so what? William Shatner just gave us the most <laughs> epic post-flight speech ever. Uh, we di I didn't even need the flight, and I would have been happy just to hear that. The flight was a great prelude and teed him up for this most amazing poetic statement about uh, things so much larger than what occurred in that four minute period when he was floating around. Uh, but for him to be able to grasp all of that, take that all in, and then, and then share it with us in such a beautiful, coherent way, literally like the lyrics of one of his spoken word songs written out right there. I don't think Jeff Bezos could even comprehend what he was hearing. Um, no, in and the middle of, of it, home, Jeff Bezos like goes and grabs a champagne bottle, and I'm like, wait a second, <laughs> Shatner's in like, having a moment to this here. Guy. Would you listen to him? He's got something to say here. <laughs> That's exactly right. I think he was like mid that. What was that? It, the, he was describing this blue comforter of sky yeah, and having it ripped off moment. in the middle of you your sleep, and you bomb. and then you're in the, the darkness, and then he literally says, "Is this death?" I mean, I'm I'm. 
I, I mean it. This is, look at him. I mean, it, I could redo this all over again, Miles. It's, it's a, it's yeah, a, I, uh, it's it was so uh, amazing. And it, it really, this is why this is cool. Uh, you know, all, technicalities aside, as more and more people that have the ability to do what we just saw, which is, a, you know, an innate talent, as more and more people have that experience, we're going to understand what this is all about in, in a really profound way. And really, we, we, you know, ultimately, as anybody who's gone to space will tell you, what you focus on is us, Earth, home, and we will understand our planet better. And, you know, I, I don't want to get too schmaltzy and carried away here, but this is this is actually how we bring people together. On the planet. No, that, that, I'll take schmaltzy any day with you, Miles. Thank you, Miles, for sharing this moment. Thank you, William Shatner, for being William Shatner. Nichelle, it's great to see you. Kristen Fisher on the ground giving us all the reporting. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. All right, much more to come for us, as we will be continuing to wait to see more videos will be released, I'm sure, by Blue Origin. We'll bring that to you when we get it.